no one's perfect, right? I mean, we all make mistakes from time to time. Now, often when we make a mistake, we can apologize, we can say sorry, or we can try and fix the problem that was created in the first place. But when we have languages like CSS, there's no take backs. So when the people who are working on the spec for it, once something got implemented, it was there to stay. But that doesn't mean that the people who have been working on CSS and doing all of this don't realize that they've made mistakes along the way. And actually they have a page dedicated to the mistakes that they've made. Hello my friend and friends, welcome back to yet another video. I'm so glad that you've come to join me once again. And if you're new here, my name is Kevin and here at my channel, I help you fall madly, deeply in love with CSS. And if I can't get you to fall in love with it, I'm hoping to at least help you be a little bit less frustrated by it. And yes, today we're looking at the things that the CSS working group got wrong. I know people like just piling onto CSS sometimes. That's not what I wanna do in this video, but I do wanna look at, I think, celebrate a little bit the honesty they've had at realizing there was mistakes made. Look at them, look at what the implications of of them are and talk even about why they can't take them back. So let's go and look at this, what I'm talking about. And yeah, there you go, everything. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, you know me, I love CSS. So uh, let's. here's the actual page. Um, and so it's an incomplete list of mistakes in the design of CSS. And it's not this huge list, but there is quite a bit to here. Some of them I wanna skim through and just go quickly over and other ones I wanna spend a little bit more time on. Um, I guess some of them have more implications today, but things like this, box sizing should have been border box by default. Like that would have been smart if they had done that, but they didn't. And this is actually something I get asked about a lot is why is it not the default or why have they not changed it to be the default? And the reason for that is pages are built assuming that that's not the default value. And there's a lot of pages that were built before we could even change the border box sizing. So if all of a sudden the browsers decided, you know what, this is going to be the new default, all those sites that relied on it not being the default would potentially break. And especially because in the old days when we weren't making that change, widths were really important. And it was, you're doing a lot of math on things with the width plus the padding and the border and all of that to get the right sizes because we didn't have these squishy flex boxes that sort of figured things out for us. So yeah, that's why it's not the default and why we can't change a lot of these things once they're in the spec because that would break the internet. Um, but some of the other one, white space, no wrap, should be white space, no wrap with a hyphen. This is uh, one of those ones that gets me and I don't even know if it's in here, but there's the one that's the same with um, flex wrap, right? Flex wrap, no wrap like that when I don't understand why it's not hyphenated when everything else in CSS is hyphenated. Another thing I think that drives people uh, nuts is percentage heights to be calculated based on fill available rather than the undefined being undefined in auto situations. So I'm sure you've given something a height of 100% and just nothing has happened. And then you have to, you know, it's the whole like on the HTML and the body, you have to first put a height of 100% so that the other things can go against that height. And it's a little bit annoying. So this, if this had been done, it would solve the problem. So that would be one of those things. Uh, so that's one of those things that has often gotten in our way and it's not hard to fix the problem, but it's, you know, you do have to do a little bit of work to, to get around it a lot of the time. What, one of the ones I really like here is table layouts should be sane because, <laughs> um, I, for me, like this doesn't bother me. I don't think we should really be doing table layouts anyway, but I like how the, like, we don't really have a solution. It's just this, it's, it's tables are the worst and they shouldn't be. Here's, you know, there's other things like this where they're being a little bit more retrospective in that it's not really a mistake, but because it and it was used a lot in the 90s, we were using repeating backgrounds a lot. But nowadays, the background repeat being no repeat is usually what we end up doing. Uh, but I mean, the amount of times, you know, the starry backgrounds that we might have on the old GeoCity sites and stuff like that, you were just coming in with a small image and having that repeat for your entire background, or you could even use repeating backgrounds to create patterns and do other stuff. Um, so it was a very common design pattern that has since shifted over time. Uh, what I like is Z index actually should have been Z order or depth and just work on all elements. So that one is definite. Like, so you don't need to do position relative and then add a Z index. Um, and then having Z order, I think makes more sense just because if it's the ordering or the depth, so like depth four and then a depth 10, the depth 10 is, you know, Maybe depth doesn't work because the higher the number, is it going higher or is it going lower? But you get the idea, um, a better name there. Um, I like this is the only one that has bold on it, root of all margin collapsing evil. So I'm just saying um, the top and bottom margins of a single box should never be allowed to collapse together automatically as is as it is the root of all margin collapsing evil. So yes, I, I definitely agree with that. Uh, margin collapsing is a pain. <laughs> um, it's no fun, especially because 
They seem to have realized that was a mistake. So with flex and with grid items, their margins don't collapse anymore. But that causes more confusion too, because then you have some situations where you do have margin collapse and other places where you don't. Um, and yeah, if you don't know what margin collapse is, it's when margins meet each other, they they melt into each other basically. And if I have a video, I'll put a card up there or something um, if you don't know what that is because it's definitely something you should understand. Um, current color should actually be dashed current color instead, uh, which makes sense because it's like the only camel case that's anywhere in CSS and everything else is um, the kebab case. So yeah, I definitely get that. They say likewise all color multi-word keyword names um, where what's a keyword name in a color? Like Rebecca Purple is the only one I can think of off the top of my head. I don't mind the color values being single words, um, but definitely agree on that, that it's a little weird to have a one thing that's camel case in all of CSS. An interesting one here is the RGBA and the HSLA should not exist and it should have just been RGB uh, with an optional fourth parameter instead, but they have fixed that. We don't need, you know, we, RGBA is still there, but you can just put RGB and include an alpha value and it's going to work. Same with HSL. So um, they sort of changed RGB to have that optional one. So they've, they've done that. Just the old ones can never go away because a lot of people have used them. Um, one thing that I think a lot of people here would agree on is this one. Flexbox should have been less crazy about flex basis versus width and height. Perhaps if width height is auto, use flex basis. Otherwise, stick with the width height as an inflexible size. This also makes min max and width height behavior fall out of the generic definition, um, which is I think some people, I think a lot of people get confused with the relation, what flex basis really does, which it depends on the flex direction. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, if you don't really get what they're talking about, I think it's just so you can think about things in a bit more of a sane way uh, and understand the defaults and just know sort of what's going to have the impact where uh, in a little bit of an easier way, which I, I can agree with. Um, here's an interesting one. Selectors have terrible future proofing. And what, what they're mentioning actually here is just if you have like comma separated selectors, if any of those comma separated selectors is an invalid selector, it breaks that entire rule. And that can, they're just saying like future proofing. So if ever something got deprecated, I guess, um, you could potentially break an entire rule because one of the selectors doesn't work. Um, but it can also be really frustrating when you do comma separated selectors like that. So it is good to know about that though. Uh, but they're saying you should have only ignored that one invalid selector in the list, not to break the entire rule that you've just created with say five selectors in it. This one's kind of interesting where display should have been display type. I think it's just to be a bit more verbose just to say like display type block, display type inline, uh, just so you'd be thinking about it more in that way. Sure, I, you know, I wouldn't mind something like that, but it is what it is. Display I think is okay. Um, I like a list style properties should have been called marker style. So instead of list style, it's the marker style because you're not changing the style of the list. You're changing the style of the markers themselves. Uh, and now we also have the marker pseudo class that we can use or pseudo element that we can use. So yeah, an interesting one there. Um, the other one I was talking about with Flexbox is right here. The alignment properties in Flexbox should have been writing mode relative, not flex flow relative. And thus could have been um, so we could have a line inline and then a line block. So instead of having like a line content or a line items and then justify content in that, that where, you know, it, the justify versus align can be a little bit weird. So if you're just doing a line inline uh, versus a line block, so you're talking about, is it on the inline axis or is it on the block axis? And it would have just made life a little bit easier, um, which I get, but I'm curious, like if you did do that way and then you're changing the flex direction, how that sort of would impact things as well. So it's an interesting thought though, for sure, um, that would probably get it being a bit easier to understand, uh, you know, when you're thinking about it. And they're saying it should have been writing mode relative and not flex flow relative anyway. Um, I think it'd just be easier, I guess, to wrap your mind around how things are working. And if ever you're changing the flex direction, then you could just change the flex flow or whatever, the align flow that you're doing, um, you know, it's not hard to change both at the same time. So an interesting one there. Uh, for anyone who's used shape outside, it should have been called wrap, <laughs> um, wrap something, which I definitely agree with. The shape outside is a weird name. It does, it's cool. I like it a lot. If you don't know what it is, there's a video, uh, link it in the description, but it's a really cool one. You can wrap text around images basically. 
uh, but I, it's a weird name for sure. And the last one is important, shouldn't have been called that because from anybody who's coming from another language sees that as not important. So it makes it look like you're taking this and making it less important than what it is instead of saying it's more important. So I thought that was a really interesting one. And what I really like about this page is it's CSS sort of saying, look, we could have done things a little bit better. We're stuck with this, but we're learning from our mistakes along the way because some of these things have been addressed in the newer things and the newer parts of the spec that they're working on or adding, like I said, the margin collapse behavior is different in certain situations now because they realize it's kind of, you know, hard to do that or they have brought in better naming for the newer things that are coming. And often a lot of these new things like grid are replacing older ways that we used to do things anyway. So I think that's the right approach to be taking with it all. And so it's good to know that people are, you know, we're, we're trying to improve things and we're not just, they're not just throwing mud at the wall and hoping it sticks and coming up with these crazy things. There's a lot of people putting a lot of effort and thought into creating the spec and often people say that things could be done better, but you don't often give a solution to it. They just say this doesn't make any sense and they're really frustrated by it. But I really do think one of the things that people get very frustrated by it with is because they don't really understand the foundation that CSS is built on and they're not thinking about it the right way. We're not thinking about building pages in the way that we should be with CSS. And there's a difference there. It doesn't mean that it doesn't work well. It just means that maybe you're not in the right frame of mind for it. And I know one thing that people struggle with a lot is creating responsive sites because that's another frame of mind that you have to go into with all these unknowns that, you know, you don't know the size of the screen or the height of the screen. And there's lots with CSS that is dealing with these unknown situations. And if you do struggle with making responsive sites, I actually have a free course called Conquering Responsive Layouts, completely free 21 day course to walk you through and get you into that right mindset about building responsive websites so they're less of a struggle and less of a frustration. So if that sounds good to you, I've put a link to it down in the description. And with that, I'd like to say a very big thank you to my supporters of Awesome over on Patreon, Jan, Johnny, Stuart, and Tim, as well as all my other patrons. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your corner on the internet just a little bit more awesome.